Greetings. Welcome to worship. February 20th, 2022. Glad you're here. This week, we have a couple of things you might be interested in participating in. One that I'm excited about is the Neighborhood Ministries Volunteer Orientation Program. This is taking place Wednesday afternoon, the 23rd, from 3.30 to 5. If you might be interested in volunteering with Neighborhood Ministries, um, stop by the church. We are going to be doing that in person. We don't expect a huge crowd. Everyone will be required to wear masks and be distanced. The other event taking place is on Thursday. Thursday, we're having a church council meeting to talk about changes in some of our operating procedures based on Steve's retirement that he's been moving toward for the last couple of years. Um, with that, let's open our hearts, open our minds, realize we're always connected by the Holy Spirit and worship together. Good morning, Edge Hill. Um, I invite you to join with me in saying today's call to worship. Once again, we gather from different homes and circumstances with different dreams and ideas, different values and tastes, different in age and color, different in gender and language. Yet we are one family, children of God, everyone. We join our hearts in worship we join our voices in praise, and we join our lives as the body of Christ. Let's pray together. Loving and merciful God, we are more willing to carry the weight of our hatred our jealousy, our prejudice, our guilt, than to be lifted by the wings of forgiveness and compassion. We often look only to the tip of our own noses and miss the opportunity for communion that passes by in a sister or brother who is different. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen, we say to ourselves, and yet we allow the very words to smother our heart's desire for relationship. Free us to relate. Free us to be wept upon by those whom we have offended. Free us to move into the household of mercy and know that only by your grace do we have another day to love and be loved. Come, Mother Divine, and grant us a liberated spirit, a resurrected life, a new opportunity to take our seat at the table and share the cup and loaf. Hear these words of assurance. The Spirit of God is upon us. God has called us to bring good news and liberation with the impoverished, to the marginalized, and to all who are in need everywhere. Through God, we can do all things. God's Spirit surrounds us with forgiveness and love. Come and fill our hearts 
with your peace. You alone, O Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Confide me, Domino, Quoni Ambonus. Confide me, Domino, Alleluia. Let us pray. Loving God, teacher of hard truths, we pray to you this day surrounded by your love shared within the people of Edge Hill. We ask that you hear our prayers, you know our anxieties and our fears. Comfort us during difficult times. Empower us to let go of our anger toward those who prosper through deceit and unscrupulous ways. Shaped by our world, we find it hard to believe that the meek will inherit the earth because we see them being crushed by unjust systems stacked on top of each other against them. We long to see the vindication of the righteous and the prosperity of those who work selfishly to bring your realm here on earth. We yearn for the day when all people will treat one another as they wish to be treated. Help us live into that day, loving God, even when it is difficult, that your love may shine like the sun through our lives and our ministries here in the Edge Hill neighborhood. Amen. Today's reading is the second week of digesting Jesus' Sermon on the Plain. This is Luke's version of what's considered by many as Jesus' greatest sermon. In it, the Jesus we love is preaching a difficult message for many to understand. It's brilliantly faithful in pointing out what makes God's love so powerful. 
and it's also dangerous when misused in ways to dismiss the pain and suffering of the oppressed and abused. I invite you to hear this reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, 27 to 38. But I say to you, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your God is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. These are the words of God for the people of God. Amen. In last week's reading, Jesus declared blessings for the poor, hungry, sad, and outcast, and woes for the rich, the well-fed, the happy, and the admired. Now, Jesus shifts toward answering the question most of his listeners were probably thinking, at least to themselves. That question is, okay, we hear you, but what does this look like? How are we supposed to order our lives? One part of his answer to this question includes what might be considered Jesus's most well-known axiom, the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. It's his version of a message that's common across the ancient world and countless generation of parents including us here at Edge Hill, have sought to put this in the hearts of our children. The phrase golden rule has become shorthand for treat others with the respect you demand yourself. Or even more simply put, it can be said as, come on guys, let's just be fair. But I would argue that fairness doesn't seem to play a role in what Jesus is teaching here. In fact, it seems what Jesus had in mind goes far beyond fair. Here's what I mean. In answering this question of how should we live our lives, Jesus first shocks us when he says, love your enemies. What? My enemies? I don't know. They certainly don't love me. Come on, I need help. What does that even look like? So Jesus continues, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, and offer those who strike, beg, or steal, not retaliation, oh no, but a shocking kind of loving response that flips the script on them. Then he goes on, oh, by the way, those who stole from you, tell them, Keep it, it's yours. Or here's my other cheek, not just the first one you hit. Or here's my shirt, not just my coat. And remember, most people in Jesus's audience only wore two garments, nothing else, just a coat and a shirt. So summing it up, Jesus is teaching us to love our enemies, to do good, to lend generously, all while expecting nothing in return. And I think that's key, expecting nothing in return. 
That's the one thing that all his examples have in common. And it should be of no surprise to us because that is exactly how God's love for us works. God's grace is unearned, unwarranted, and undeserved. It seems that Jesus is challenging his listeners, including us, to love not as a strategy for gain, not as a this for that trade, but simply for the sake of love itself, or even better, simply for the sake of God's beloved. To bring this concept to life, we have to understand how truly revolutionary and powerful this nothing in return idea is, especially in a culture like ours where everything operates by the rules of the market. We are all highly conditioned to ask, okay, but what's in it for me? What's in it for me might be a good question in the financial realm but it's not as helpful in the realm of love, in our own lives, and in our relationships. In our relationships, we treat each other with kindness and respect. But the question is, how often do we do that only if the person is kind and respectful to us? A good barometer might be that if they aren't kind and respectful to us, how difficult is it to treat them with kindness? Or is it easier just to cut them off altogether? We've seen that response, just to give up on people, grow. It's definitely trending upward over the past few years, isn't it? But we can't give up on people. Our job is to recognize God's love, accept it, and be changed as a result. We shift. And we begin to model a different way of being, a different way of treating others. Shift to being kind, generous, and respectful, even when we're not going to gain anything from it personally. Kindness becomes unconditional. We do it because it's who we are and whose we are. We don't tell ourselves, I'll treat them well, but I expect them to treat me well in return. Even though that's probably what would be considered fair. We don't say, if you love me, I'll love you. Or if you do good for me, I'll do good for you. Or I'll do this for you now, but you're gonna owe me one at some time in the future. Fairness is unrelated to unconditional love. Jesus argues that the very idea of a fair exchange reduces love to a commodity, to something that can be bought and sold. That's not true love. By contrast, true love should not be caught up in trade. True love expects nothing in return. It nurtures for the good of the one being loved. It also gives to those who can never repay us and it is being kind to those who may never be kind to us in return. So yes, to the extent that fairness depends on conditions, true love isn't fair. It lives and moves far beyond fairness. It doesn't keep score because it's a gift, not a payment. True love is unearned, unwarranted, and undeserved just like God's grace and love for us. Jesus teaches that God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And this is exactly the love Jesus calls us to live out as children of God, human beings created in God's image. Be merciful just as God is merciful. It is literally the kind of love we were created to do. It's what we were made for. So as you reflect on this reading, recognize it's difficult, but I want you to relax and recognize Jesus is clearly using some playful hyperbola to make his points in some of his examples, like giving more to a thief than the thief actually takes in the first place. 
that helps us recognize that the thief is also a beloved child of God. And it creates in us an absurd state of generosity, a state of pure mercy, a state of grace. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a liberating thing. Created in God's image, we are instructed to love the way God loves. But it's time for our disclaimer. Sadly, like in any great teaching, this one is open to being misused. The call to offer the other cheek, for example, or to forgive and forget, can and has been used to keep people from leaving abusive situations. And this dramatically distorts Jesus' intended message. True love always acts to end abuse, primarily for the sake of the abused, but also for the sake of the one doing the abusing, because the person harms themselves as well as the victim. This makes leaving an abusive situation and moving to a safe place and holding abusers accountable extremely consistent with loving our enemies. We've also seen today's reading weapon, weaponized and used to justify other violence and injustice. For example, as we work toward racial reconciliation in this country, one side is saying we need to start with forgiveness. We need to put the past behind us. Well, clearly, forgive and forget will never work when the pain and the injustice still exist. To use the words of Zora Neale Hurston, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say that you enjoyed it. Some people have and will continue to use scripture like this to pacify hurting people, but God does not demand our silence in times of injustice, never. Jesus invites his hearers to make a statement by offering the other cheek. It is not passively ignoring what's happened. It's an act of resistance in the face of that injustice. It's our dramatic and nonviolent response to violence. God's justice requires all of us be confronted with the ways we do harm in this world. Ideally, this leads us toward reconciliation in healing because we all need it, we all participate. Any justice that ends at punishment and not reconciliation stops short of God's plan, God's intention. And any justice that offers cheap grace without dealing with the harm inflicted on others also falls short. So in today's reading, Jesus gives us a grace-filled way to resist injustice and its harmful effects. We do not ignore what's happened but instead, we flip the script and choose grace and reconciliation, and even resurrection. In today's reading, Luke presents Jesus as a playful, provocative artist, painting pictures of love, because God is kind to the ungrateful, gracious to the ungracious, and we are created in God's image. So grace is bubbling up all around us all the time, if we stay alert we'll notice it. We'll notice it everywhere. And in our everyday lives, with all of our struggles and all the thieves and all the mean-spirited folks out there, our lives may also be full of love, full of mercy, and most of all, full of grace. Thanks be to God. Amen.
invite you to hear this benediction. Go with God's blessings. As followers of Jesus, we will love our enemies and do good to those who hate us. Go with God's blessings. As followers of Jesus, we will bless those who curse us and pray for those who persecute us. Go with God's blessings. As followers of Jesus, we will do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Go with God's blessings and be the change we want to see in this world. Amen. Thank you.